Welcome to the 457th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Chris DeRose, author of the nonfiction book, The Fighting Bunch, The Battle of Athens and How World War II Veterans Won the Only Successful Armed Rebellion Since the Revolution. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is New York Times bestselling writer Chris DeRose, author of the new book, The Fighting Bunch, The Battle of Athens and How World War II Veterans Won the Only Successful Armed Rebellion Since the Revolution. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Jeff, thank you for having me. Great. If someone hasn't heard yet about your book, The Fighting Bunch, can you explain what happened in Athens, Tennessee in 1946? Sure. You had this group of World War II veterans who had gone all over the world, the South Pacific and through Europe and North Africa. And they were told in basic training, like they'd been told in school, like they'd been told growing up, that America was a democracy. It was a free country. And during the war, they were told that they were fighting dictatorships. They were fighting the slave world. So the free world versus the slave world. And then they return after the war, and they've got plans to resume their education, to marry their sweethearts, to start families, to take up different interests in business. And they find that their community has been dominated by this corrupt political machine. Really, it had started before they left, but during the war years, after all the young men in the county were gone, things got much worse. So this horribly corrupt police force and sheriff's office and Elections had effectively disappeared. These young men had liberated the world and come back to find that they did not have a democracy at home. And they formed an all-GI ticket. They set aside their differences as Republicans and Democrats and said, those differences are subordinate to the idea that we need to have free elections and fair elections, and that we need to have an honest government. And so we need to work together to drive this machine out of town. So they formed an all-veteran ticket ran them against the machine at the August 1st, 1946 election, and found that the machine was not willing to go quietly or easily, and that if they didn't do something drastic, something that many of them had not expected, that the machine would get away with stealing yet another election. And, And so what did they do? So a, a small group of these guys, so actually let me back up. Yeah. So The sheriff and his men, after a day of, it was a day of the same things that had happened all throughout the war years. Voters who were not on the list were allowed to come and vote, some of them multiple times. Voters who lived in the community and were properly qualified to vote were turned away. In one case, a supporter of the GI ticket was shot for trying to cast a ballot. And then at the end of the day, the ballot boxes were taken to secure locations controlled by the sheriff and his men with no observer permitted. And like every other year, They were just planning to announce the results. The results would be whatever the sheriff said they were because they controlled the ballot boxes and they controlled access to the count. And so a small group of these veterans who called themselves the fighting bunch took up arms and marched on the jail and demanded these ballot boxes. And when they were not forthcoming, when they were not granted access to a public fair count of the vote, they opened fire on the jail. And so was anyone killed during this day? So miraculously, no. When you think about it, there's an all-night firefight between a group of highly trained World War II veterans and a large number of sheriff's deputies and police officers. And I think we'd be having a very different conversation and it would be a very different story if people had lost their life. But really, it seems almost like divine providence nobody's killed. A lot of people are seriously injured. Before HIPAA and before privacy laws, it actually used to be a very popular item in local newspapers to see who was coming and going from the hospital and what was wrong with them. And so you can look in the newspapers and see just more than 20 people went and shot, went and sought medical attention for stab wounds, gunshot wounds. Some people were assaulted in the aftermath of the battle, but nobody died. And so what was the outcome of the election after they, I'm assuming they successfully got the ballot boxes and were able to open them publicly? 
That's right. And it was interesting. This, so this machine had an incredibly nasty reputation, right, for their willingness to do anything to win elections, to maintain their hold on power. And so the fact that there were these GIs back from the war saying, we're going to fight you for the right to run this community attracted a lot of press attention. And newspapermen would come in from uh, Nashville, from Chattanooga, from Knoxville, and they would do man on the street interviews. And they would they found it impossible to find anyone who would admit that they were voting for the machine. So the machine really had no popular support outside of the people who were directly profiting from it, the corrupt deputies, the corrupt police officers, the corrupt politicians, and the, you know, people who were running illegal gambling in the county and illegal prostitution in the county under the protection of the machine. Outside of that, there really wasn't a lot of support uh, for these guys because they had just run a horribly corrupt and brutal mini dictatorship here during the war years, and people couldn't wait to see the backs of them. And so they lost? Yeah, the GI ticket ran away with the election. And I'm curious, what was outside of just raw power and control, what were the benefits of the machine? Was it patronage jobs and that type of thing? Yeah, so in those days, law enforcement was compensated based on how many arrests they could make. So there's a really perverse incentive to arrest somebody for no reason or no good reason put them in jail where the sheriff would get a fee for housing them. Sometimes they'd arrest somebody right before midnight and release them right after midnight, and the sheriff would claim two-day fees for housing the prisoner. And so it was a really lucrative racket for these corrupt deputies and corrupt police officers. And that's just the money that was on the books. Once they had eliminated the power of the people to remove them through a free election, they raised taxes through the roof. They created all kinds of uh, unnecessary government offices and paid them very well. They increased uh, salaries for the existing office holders. And so really, yeah, it's patronage, it's profit. And for the people it benefited, it, it benefited them a great deal. For most of the people who lived in McMinn County, uh, it was horrible. And so who was the mastermind, so to speak, behind the uh, machine? Was it the sheriff alone or was it a group of people? Sure. So the machine that is defeated at the Battle of Athens is originates in the 1936 election with Paul Cantrell. And he's the youngest son of a prominent banking family. They own the utility and a lot of young sons from families like this. He tries to distinguish himself in politics. And it looks like when he does run for office, he really has, he has noble intentions. He's inspired by Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. He, he, there's no question that he's running against a Republican regime in the county that had been calcified and that was corrupt in its own way. And so he's elected in 1936. A lot of people are excited. They say, hey, we're going to get a fresh start as a county. The guys who've had power since the end of the Civil War are gone and we have some fresh blood in the office. But really quickly, it's clear that not only are the things that were wrong not going to change, but they get worse in many ways. Incidences of police brutality where the officers aren't disciplined or reprimanded or prosecuted. And businesses, illegal businesses like bootlegging, casinos, roadhouses, brothels, they're allowed to operate freely in the county because the law is whatever the sheriff says it is. In Tennessee, there's a three-term limit on holding the sheriff's position. And so after three terms, Paul Cantrell passes the torch to Pat Mansfield, who is his chief deputy, and then... Cantrell goes and serves in the state Senate. He's effectively the boss of the organization, regardless of what title he's holding. He's the person in charge. And along with him and Pat Mansfield, they basically run the county together for a decade. So after the Battle of of Athens and the machine lost, what was the aftermath of all of that? It's really remarkable. And I think it's a testament to magnanimity. Usually in history, rebellions go beyond their mandate. They go beyond what they had initially intended to do, and they can be incredibly punitive. If you think about the French Revolution or the Cuban Revolution, but they can go far beyond what they had initially set out to do and be quite vicious toward people who were in power before them or to other elements of the rebellion. In, in McMinn County, there was a real sense of, let's just move on. We wanted our county back. We got our county back. Forcing these people to fight for their lives is going to force them to fight for their lives. And we're not going to be finished with the violence or the division for some time. 
And so let's just set what happened in the past aside and move forward together. And the GI ticket implemented some really important reforms, among them putting police officers and deputies on salaries so there was no more financial incentive to arrest people for any and no reason, putting the sheriff himself uh, on a salary, and making sure that at the next election there were free elections. And think about this. In 1946, you have a six-hour firefight in the downtown of an American county seat to contest a disputed election. And two years later, the Democrats who lose the 1948 election actually took out a full-page newspaper ad to say, hey, we didn't win, but we were given a fair chance at the polls. Only legal votes were counted. Observers were allowed to witness every aspect of the process, so it was transparent. And so we had a fair election, and we just want to say thanks for, for that. So that's like the biggest sea change you could imagine in a two-year period between having to, to fight it out for a public counting of the ballots and the defeated party two years later saying, thank you for at least being fair with us. When did you first hear about the events in Athens, Tennessee, and when did you decide that you would write about the fighting bunch? Yeah, so it's a great question, and it's a question I get in every interview, and so I wish I remembered the answer. <laughs> but it feels, like, it feels like something that I have known about for a very long time, and I didn't know much about it. Among the people who know about the Battle of Athens, Tennessee, it tends to just be the broad contours, that there were these group of veterans who got in a firefight and overthrew their own county government uh, in order to preserve their right to, to a fair election. That was really all I knew. And I said, boy, that's an interesting story in history. And I don't know why I wish I'd, ha- wish I'd headed out to Athens sooner. Now, I came around at just the perfect time because this was a story that was intentionally suppressed. So for starters, the young men in the fighting bunch had committed a lot of crimes. They had raided a National Guard armory. They had kidnapped seven sheriff's deputies and, and brought them into the woods. They had spent six hours shooting at the men in the jail, hitting many of them, harming many of them. They had bombed and dynamited the jail. And and so these guys had committed a a long list of crimes, and they really weren't eager to publicize their participation in this event as a consequence. And second, if the goal is unity and the goal is reconciliation, continuing to talk about what you did on the night of August 1st into 2nd, 1946, gets in the way of that. So you had this real antipathy that still exists in some quarters in McMinn County, just not to discuss it. It's an unpleasant subject. There are families now that have family members on both sides of the dispute and very close personal relationships, people on both sides of the dispute. It doesn't really serve them well to be talking about it. And so in a lot of ways, I came around at just the right time in that there were still some people around who had firsthand information. And there were still, I call them the children of these veterans, but they're in their 70s and 80s. And uh, the children of these veterans were still around and they had their father's papers, diaries, letters, and, and were good enough to give me access to them. And in one really important case, I was able to get the audio tapes of Bill White, who's really among the ringleaders of this veteran revolt. And uh, I had four hours of his unfettered thoughts on uh, cassette tapes. And so really incredible as the first person outside of his family to to get access to those. So I first, I'd always thought in the back of my head as a writer, you have an ongoing series of stories you're interested in where you say, huh, maybe that'll be a book someday. Maybe that's something I'll work on in the future. And then whenever you finish your previous project, you think, okay, here are the three or four things I've been thinking about working on. What's next? And I just really had a strong feeling that, you know, this story was, If I wanted to write about this, I really had to move quickly. And there's no question that uh, this story couldn't have waited much longer uh, to be researched and told. And I missed a lot of the veterans, certainly, who participated in it. But many of them never discussed it. Never Some of them never discussed it with their own family. And so it's really quite quite an interesting and amazing case of history being buried underground and, and having to search for it. So what was your research process for the book? So you start with looking through some period newspapers and looking for names, people who were associated with the GI ticket. That aspect of it is obviously public. The GI candidates, their campaign manager, Jim Buttram, the senior advisor, Ralph Dugan, and you know, trying to track down their family members. And so you start there. And Bill White 
who really is the, the focal character of my book, I was able to find his widow and his grandson, Travis. And so you were trying to find family members just to see what, what did their loved ones leave behind? And it varied. Everything from, in Bill's case, to four hours of, of audio recollections to letters from Bill Grubb in San Francisco. His son gave me letters that he'd written about his experience coming back from the war and what things were like and how this GI ticket was formed. So really, it's like pulling on the thread of a sweater. You just keep um, grabbing at everything that, that you've got in front of you and and trying to get names of people who were involved and reaching out to them and their families and um, looking for more newspaper sources. So you find out there's an audio broadcast of the event. There's a ra- you know two radio men from Knoxville had come in and broadcast uh, live downtown on the night. I wonder if I can find these original tapes. Sure enough, I was able to track down the original tapes of that 1946 broadcast. Uh, a yeah. guy named yeah, a guy named Johnny Perkle who is a renowned radio man in East Tennessee. He remembered listening to the Battle of Athens as a young boy on the radio. And it was one of the things that helped inspire him to go into radio himself. And he interned for the radio station in Knoxville that had done this election night broadcast. And he said, boy, these original acetates are just sitting here. And if they're allowed to sit here, they're eventually going to uh, waste away or disappear, be thrown out. And so he made copies. Uh, and so I was able to get eyewitness in real time observations of what was happening in downtown Athens. So it's really incredible. The museum in Athens, really a county that really takes their history seriously. But because of the tensions on both sides of this conflict, it never had an exhibit to the Battle of Athens until the end of 2018. So right before I went there for the first time, it was the first time that their museum so much as acknowledged that this had happened. And now they have quite, quite a good exhibit about it. But they had done a documentary on the Battle of Athens in 2007, including interviews with some people who were no longer around. And the museum was willing to give me, they found the uncut footage of those interviews. So it might be five minutes in the documentary, but someone like Chuck Redfern, who was a reporter who was downtown all night on August 1st, he gave a, an interview that lasted an hour and a half. And so I got that whole interview, even though he's not wow, around anymore. That's great. Yeah, I was able to get his perspective. And so I came at it from a lot of different directions and was really pleased by what I found. My, my favorite review, I think, that I got so far was from someone on Goodreads who said, it feels like the events of the book happened in 360 around Krista Rose, that I was literally describing things that I'd witnessed personally. And I thought that was the absolute highest praise I could get, that I was able to stitch together this story from so many, like putting together a giant puzzle. And I'm not good at puzzles, but I guess I'm okay at putting together historic puzzles. But it was, it was really a great testament. And it was what I was going for. How do I recreate this event that had been purposely obscured for so many years, when most of the people who had anything to do with it are long gone? It was a challenge. And, and was there anything that particularly surprised you as you were doing the research? Anything that kind of stood out? Yes. So one of the things, we tell ourselves stories as a people, and those stories could be true or not true, but they often serve a purpose. And there's this part of that gets told in McMinn County, Tennessee, is that, hey, things really weren't so bad before the Battle of Athens. And you can see the, the usefulness behind that story, that if, the, if Paul Cantrell's machine was just doing what had happened before him, then he's really not to blame. And the people who supported him really aren't to blame. And things weren't so bad. Really, we, we, need to take, we need to take the bad guys out of the equation here. It's a story with no bad guys. It was just a conflict. And it was based on things that were out of these people's control. And it's useful if you're a community trying to reconcile itself after a period of division where some really awful things had been done to people, but you're trying to move on. So when I undertook this story, you read in the newspapers that there's this con- there was one congressman that the people in this county could count on to try to publicize incidents of election fraud and voter fraud and intimidation. And he would say in the newspaper, I've submitted all these affidavits to the Department of Justice. And so I said, huh, has anyone ever asked for these at the Department of Justice? And so if you've ever seen the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's that room where they put the Ark of the Covenant at the end of Raiders a giant government warehouse full of uh, boxes and dusty manila envelopes. But sure enough, 
there are over a thousand first person, first hand accounts of what happened in Athens, Tennessee during the war years from people who'd been held at gunpoint in polling places, from people who had watched sheriff's deputies swap ballot boxes in plain view of everyone, or dump batches of ballots into boxes in plain view of everyone for years. And so and I had over a thousand of these affidavits and letters describing just how bad things were. And so I think the extent of just how just how severe the problem was that these young men came home to, that is something that had been sanitized for the purposes of you know people who live there today being able to get along with one another and to not hold any grudges. But things were bad. And indeed, the Attorney General of the United States said these are the worst allegations of voter fraud that have ever been presented to the Department of Justice, which is saying something in America in 1946. I mean, that's quite a dubious distinction. They had a lot of competition. True. Well, given recent events in the U.S. and the storming of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, some people might want to compare the events you write about in The Fighting Bunch to present-day politics. How would you respond to that comparison? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. I I watched horrified, like most Americans, at this attempt, this violent attempt to try to to thwart the electoral process. And I just knew, I went on Twitter, and you you always open Twitter with trepidation anyway, because it's Twitter. (laughs) You're like, gosh, he's going to make me happy. What I see is going to make me happy. But I just knew there'd be people on there comparing this to the Battle of Athens. And so I pushed back on as much of it as I could, but I'm glad you asked the question. So for starters, the, the the people of McMinn County tried doing the things that you would do if you felt you were victimized during the process of trying to cast a ballot. They they brought their case to court. The problem in Tennessee is that Tennessee was really under the control of one man, a person by the name of Boss Crump, who operated out of Memphis. And Boss Crump controlled the judiciary of the state. He had all the levers of power but he also controlled the judiciary. And so they're not bringing their case before neutral judges. They're bringing their cases before judges that are part of the Crump machine, judges who would lose their position if they ever ruled against Crump or one of his allies. And that's for starters. In in this case, there were over 60 challenges to the results of the presidential election in multiple states, and none of them went anywhere. None of them presented substantive evidence of fraud or systematic mistakes that could possibly threaten the results of the election. It just didn't happen. They had fair hearings. And not only did they have fair hearings, they had fair hearings in front of judges that in many cases the president himself appointed. Highly qualified appointees looked at it and just said in some of the strongest languages, I graduated law school in 2005, some of the strongest language I've ever seen from judges to just say there is nothing here. And so compare that with the unmistakable vote fraud when a sheriff's deputy puts a gun in your face and orders you out of the polling place or takes the ballot box into the jail to count in secret. They announce the results and you're not allowed to look at the ballots. Like it's night and day difference in terms of what's being alleged and what happened and the ability to seek recourse. Who controls the civil rights department of the Department of Justice before January 20th? Who's in charge of investigating, you know, the, the, it's the president's attorney general and Bill right. Barr, Bill Barr, who I don't think anyone would accuse uh, of being, having antipathy toward his boss said, Hey, there's just nothing to this at all. We've investigated it. There's yep. no, no voter fraud, no systematic errors. And no one's going to accuse him of, of not being a good soldier, but that was his opinion. And so the, the young men and the people of McMinn County and 1946 would have loved to have been able to participate in an election like the one we had. It's transparent. People are allowed to make observations. They're allowed to observe every meaningful step of the process. And if they think there's some serious allegation, they can take it into court in front of a fair, independent judge who's going to make a ruling. So none of those things were present. And I should point out, too, that these people endured in your face voter fraud, can't believe it happened in America style voter fraud for a decade before a small number of them resorted to violence. That's what it took first. I know that you created your own podcast, the Phantom Marine podcast. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, thank you. I would love to. While I was writing this story, I'll tell you this is one of the most fun parts of being a historian is that you just get to sit and read old newspapers and it's work. It, it doesn't feel like work, but it's part of your job. So you sit and read old newspapers and it's often the case that you come across stories you've never heard of that you find to be very interesting. And while I was reading the Athens newspaper from 19, 1946, I saw a little AP item on a guy named William Langston, who the paper referred to as the Phantom Marine. I said, that sounds interesting. And it was clearly referencing previous coverage of the event. So I started looking through it, you know, through newspaper databases. And turns out this guy, William Langston, was declared killed in action on Iwo Jima. And 10 months later, somebody showed up in his hometown claiming to be William Langston. He was accepted as William Langston by all the people he met. He wasn't like hiding from people. He was out in bars. He was out in pool halls. He spent the night at the home of of someone he'd known since he was a child and then vanished again. And I said, this is a really compelling mystery. And I actually, uh, I'm distractible. I'm easily distractible. I spent three days tracking down this mystery and not working on the fighting bunch because I, I absolutely had to know how this ended. And so first I thought I would just go find the Wikipedia on this to see how it ended up. You really don't normally have a case that's headline news. And this was headline news everywhere in the United States, front page cover of every newspaper for you know weeks, and then just falls off the earth with no resolution. That's, that's usually not the case. So I figured I'm just going to look on the Wikipedia, see how this ended, get back on with my life. Turns out there's no Wikipedia, there's no digital footprint at all of this story outside of these 70 plus year old newspapers. And so I started tracking down William Langston's family to say, hey, did he ever show up again? Did he ever try to make contact with you? Did you guys ever figure out who this was who showed up in Newport, Arkansas? And it turned out there was really a lot of digging left to do. And so that's what I'm hoping to do on the podcast. I'm interviewing family members. I've FOIA'd a ton of government documents. I have FBI files that the family never knew existed and his military personnel record. And I'm trying to figure out who it was that showed up in Newport, Arkansas, convinced the whole town that he was someone who grew up there and then vanished again. And how he was, if it was an imposter, how he was able to do that so convincingly. And if it's not Langston, you know, who's, or if it was Langston, who's buried in his grave, originally in Iwo Jima and then reinterred in Hawaii. So it's a really fascinating mystery. I appreciate you asking me about it. So far, I, I don't have the, the answer. So do you think that will end up becoming a future book? You know, it's interesting. The reason I did the podcast was because I didn't think it worked so well as a book, right? Mm-hmm. Just from, yeah. a, from a life perspective. But the story has some interesting twists and turns. Like somebody reappears in Memphis writing weird letters to the newspaper claiming to be Langston. And there's some clues in there that strongly suggest that it, it is the same guy who appeared in Newport, Arkansas. So it has some weird twists and turns. And his wife had just gotten remarried to a new man and they did an investigation. And I've been able to interview her daughters and to get their mother's perspective on all this. And there's some interesting twists and turns, but there's no real resolution. So I didn't think it would work well as a book, but it also wasn't a mystery that I felt good about setting aside. I wanted to get to the bottom with of it. I wanted to help this family, this Gold Star family that has been wondering for 70 years. And he's got nieces and nephews and grandchildren still alive. And when I started this process, his son was still alive. And fortunately, I got to interview him before he passed away. But this was a mystery I had to settle for my own sake. And it was a really interesting mystery that I wanted to share with others. And so that's why I thought the podcast is such a good format for it, because it's as long as it needs to be, unlike a book, which has to meet certain certain length requirements and expectations. Got it. So you were a lawyer and worked in the legal field. What led you to writing nonfiction historical books? Yeah, so I grew up loving history. I read history books. I loved history. I loved stories, like your listeners. And I always thought I might write a book someday. But when I was was practicing law around 2008, I was reading a biography of James Madison. And there's one paragraph in this biography that explains that to get to the first Congress, where Madison wrote our entire Bill of Rights and established many important precedents that persist to this day, He had to defeat another future president, James Monroe, his good friend, in an election for Congress in Virginia. And it occurred to me, like, this is the most important congressional election in history. This is really more important than most presidential elections. 
because Madison really needs to be in that first Congress or we don't get our Bill of Rights. And if we don't get our Bill of Rights, the country almost certainly would have broken up in the, by, by 1790, 1791. And I tried to find a book about it and there was no book about it. And so I said, well, I'm just going to write this book. And at 28 and 29, you don't know what you don't know. And mm-hmm. there'd be no problem. I'll write a, I'll just write a book. And to be honest, it was very serendipitous. I pitched one agent and it was just a friend of mine who had go- ghost written a book for this politician. And I said, hey, would you introduce me to your agent? He said, no problem. So I talked to this agent for 15 minutes. He goes, I'd love to represent this project. And 10 weeks later, I had a publisher. And I, I want to assure your audience, lest they hate me for this, um, <laughs> that nothing since then in publishing or in the rest of my life has, has been that easy. It was just a smooth, serendipitous process. And looking back on it, I very easily could have just been one of those people endlessly querying agents or sending in manuscripts into the slush pile to be reviewed by interns. I just feel like things really came together to get that first book published. And so with the success of that book, I was off to the races. Simon & Schuster bought my next book, and I've I've mostly been writing full-time since then. I took a a break in 2015 to go work for the new Attorney General of Arizona, where I served as Assistant Solicitor General and then Senior Litigation Counsel, and got to work on some absolutely fascinating cases, some, some really important cases that you'd never get to work on in the private sector. And when that was finished, you know, I thought to myself, okay, I really miss writing and I'd like to try it again. And that was when I wrote my fourth book. And so that's why you've got a long pause between three and four. But it's it, the begin at the beginning when I really needed an agent, needed a publisher, and I had no ostensible credibility or, or platform to try and sell a book. Things just really worked out very smoothly. So are you working on another book now? I am. In fact, my agent just submitted a new proposal this week about the Cuban Revolution. So there's this, this, you know, this incredible event in American his- or in, in world history that had enormous impact on American history, and one that I don't think is well understood. People are widely aware of it, like you know, Che Guevara and, and Fidel Castro and the Cuban Missile Crisis. But it's this incredible event with all this human drama and it's really not well explored. And so one of the things I want to focus on is this one particular story to tie it all together about a young man whose father was killed by Che Guevara early in the revolution, shortly after the rebels arrive in Havana, and who ends up escape the son escapes to America, joins the army, joins the CIA, and leads the CIA effort to track down and capture Che Guevara in Bolivia six years later. It's really this incredible story about this son whose father's taken away from him, his entire world's upended by this revolution, and he's fleeing his country, and really makes it a major part of his life to to try to seek justice for his father. So there's just really all these incredible people on both sides of this revolution, and I think it's a story that that sort of needs to be pulled together and told. That sounds interesting. So what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Novels or nonfiction books? I'm reading a lot of books about Cuba right now. <laughs> I'm sure you are. No, I have been like entire shelves of it. I think people would be surprised. It feels like everyone with like a walk-on role in the Cuban Revolution has written a memoir of some kind. So interestingly, I'm writing a screenplay for another story that I came across that I didn't think would work well as a book. So I'm re Save the Cat series, which I would recommend. I think a lot of your audience uh, are authors and writers or aspiring writers. I would recommend these Save the Cat books to anyone because even if you're not going to be a screenwriter, I think they do a very good job of teaching you genre and storytelling. And, and so I think those are very valuable for that purpose. But I'm actually writing a screenplay. So I was re- refreshing myself with some of those. I found this story while I was researching the Phantom Marine. One leads to another. I found this story about a guy, a guy named Paul Mahar, who was 4F during Vietnam. He was medically ineligible. And he, you know, he tried to enlist. They wouldn't let him enlist because of some pins that he had in his arm from, it, from an injury. And his friend, Frank, got drafted and said, I just can't go to Vietnam. And after training, he went AWOL. And he said, Paul, how about you go back to the base and say you're me 
and get me a medical discharge with your elbow. And Paul went along with it. And, and Frank and, and Paul ends up sent to Vietnam five days later with no training and put into combat in Vietnam with no training under his friend's name. So this really incredible story, which I'm developing as a screenplay, I'm working with with Paul. <laughs> so the Save the Cat series are, are really, truly excellent. Reading the best and the brightest about Vietnam to familiarize myself with the war and the, the politics behind the war. Best books I've read in the past couple of years, which I try to recommend to everybody, you've got A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls, which I just think is, he's doing the best writing, best fiction writing out there today. I think. And Killers of the Flower Moon was my favorite nonfiction book. I will say there's also a series of, of mysteries that I've been getting into. This is, I was really a, a nonfiction reader, history, biography, politics. That was it for a very long time. And so I tried to branch off into crime and detective novels and uh, actually ended up joining the Mystery Writers Association of America and plan on writing my own historical mysteries. And some of the ones I really enjoy reading are the Sam Wyndham series by Abur Mukherjee, starting with A Rising Man. So they take place in India in the 1920s, still occupied by the British. He's a, a British World War I veteran who solves mysteries with a sidekick who's an Indian sergeant, and just incredibly well-written. And there's four of them now, and I'd recommend them to anyone. Those sound great. I'll have to check those out. I'm not familiar with them. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your book, The Fighting Bunch? Yeah, so you can buy The Fighting Bunch or read more about it anywhere that you'd normally buy books, uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, your local independent bookstore. My personal website is christerosebooks.com, so C-H-R-I-S-D-E-R-O-S-E books.com, and you're welcome to get in touch with me. I've got the episodes of The Phantom Marine posted on my website, and you, know, you can read reviews of my books and, and my writing and, uh, and get in touch with me that way. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Chris DeRose, author of the new book, The Fighting Bunch, The Battle of Athens, and how World War II veterans won the only successful armed rebellion since the revolution. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Chris, thanks for doing this interview. Jeff, this was a lot of fun. Thank you.